Okay, so we all use Meteor outside of work to like create prototypes for our own purposes, like for fun or to test stuff out. And I think it's a very good framework for doing like rapid iteration development and prototyping. So um, I think a lot of us need to start doing more of that in the workplace, actually. And I think if we could use Meteor to do that, it would be like a lot of value gained. So let me tell you a bit about my job. My job is like writing web applications for other people. And I have to talk to clients, figure out exactly what they want, and start building that. The problem with that is usually about 20% of the way into the project, they'll completely flip uh, what they wanted. So if you start building your product from um, the start of your project, the chances are high that you're going to have to throw out a lot of what you've built already or modify it in quite a meaningful way. So where I work, we try to build prototypes before we start building the final product. And this allows us to first gauge um, what the client wants um, and not have to throw away too much of our work. Uh, this is the most expensive slide in the entire presentation is development time. So it, I think to reduce costs of like working in an agency, you want to reduce the amount of development time to as low as possible. And basically, we need to find ways of allowing our developers to spend time doing um, more application-specific um, things. So writing code that's specific to the application rather than writing code that does the plumbing which allows you to build something which the user might want. Um, so how can Meteor be useful? I'm pretty biased because I work for an agency, so here's three things that I think Meteor could be useful. And it's basically going to be building prototypes before you build the final product. Um, the third one is slightly interesting. So there's a data sharing protocol called DDP in Meteor. And it's source agnostic. As long as you can send data in a JSON format, um, you're going to be able to use it in your main Meteor application and database. So I think it's going to be interesting to see Meteor used for Internet of Things applications, so getting data from actual physical items and using it on the web. And yeah, so this slide just pretty much reiterates what I said before. It's going to be faster. There's a free real-time database. And DDP is the protocol which allows you to consume data from many platforms and share it in real time. Um, yeah, so when I first used Meteor, I was like really surprised at how fast I could get things done. And this was my face after I built my first application. It was, I think it was a Stack Overflow clone I was tasked to create in like a few days. And then I, I was done in a few hours and I was just amazed at like how productive I was and how much time I could spend like playing table tennis instead of writing code. And I think we can attribute a lot of that um, experience to Meteor's framework design. And this talk is called The Design of Simple. I'm pretty much going to go over two things in this talk. Um, it's going to be partly how Meteor synchronizes data across all of its applications, all of its uh, open connections, which could be a web client, it could be a hardware client, it could be anything you want. Um, I think Mr. Shaw is doing a DDP presentation a bit later on, which might go into that. And the other thing is the separation of two different types of um, actions you usually write in web applications. Um, it's the separation of interaction activated actions and data activated actions. I'll go more into that a bit later. Um, yeah, so DDP is a protocol which is based on, which is passed on JSON, and it syncs up all your open connections to have the same data set. Um, I thought Alan's talk would come first, but he'll, he'll explain more about it a bit later on. Um, so one of the biggest things about Meteor is the data synchronization that's built in. Um, it allows you to query a database in real time and then receive those changes pretty much instantly on all of your clients. 
Now, the implementation behind that is called op log tailing, and people often like look at me kind of bemused when I say that, um, because op log isn't even a word. So, <laughs> <laughs> firstly, that stands for operation log, and it's a store of all the writes you make to your database. And MongoDB actually first implemented that to like help with creating replicas of a primary database. So if you're like building a large-scale web application and you've got a lot of data in your database, you want to have availability even if one goes down. So you'll have your primary database, that barrel over there. You'll have some, it'll be empty at the start, but eventually you'll like put data in there. And then you're gonna have, you're gonna log every write operation into an operation log and you'll receive a tailable cursor. I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. And this data will be replicated in all of your secondaries. There's just one shown here, but there's probably going to be more than one. And then if there's a huge fire and your primary <laughs> database is down, you'll use one of your secondary databases so there's no downtime. Um, can I get a thumbs up and or down on whether anyone understood what I just said? So, well, mostly up. Okay, I think there was like there's some sideways over in the middle, so I'm gonna quickly do a short demonstration on what I actually mean. Um, okay, so firstly, there's this tailable cursor idea, which is kind of weird. That basically allows you to query a database, but then also listen on for any changes that were made later on, and. That was kind of inspired by the tail command in Unix, uh, the tail f command. So I'm going to pretend to be a secondary database here. Bear with me. Huh? Uh, yeah, sorry. True. So there's nothing in the op log at the moment. Um, so if we imagine we're going to start like adding, inserting items into our database. We can track each write operation. So if I was to insert an item into the cats table, I'm going to just put something human readable. So insert like grumpy and this age is five or something like that. So when I save this, it's going to show us insert grumpy age five. So if I was a secondary database, which is a really bad idea, because I'm not highly reliable or highly available. Um, I don't know. Okay, insert grumpy age five, so I can start like making a text file. Sounds like a good idea. So uh, I know grumpy is the index, and his age is going to be five. Um, so when we make our next write operation, maybe we want to update grumpy. So update grumpy, and imagine this is actually going into a database somewhere, and it's not just in my mind. Uh, update Grumpy, and his age is uh, four. Mm -hmm. He's like the Benjamin Button of cats. And it should be showing up over here, and it does show up. So I know, okay, where's Grumpy? Grumpy's over here. I've only actually got one item in this database. So this is pretty easy work so far. <laughs> okay, so basically Meteor uses this simple idea um, based on MongoDB's tailable cursor, which is based on that. And your uplog items are going to look something more like this. Um, so if you did insert a grumpy, you'd get a timestamp, h, which is a unique ID, the operation, which is an insert. Um, this is a namespace, and then the actual object. So what Meta did was they actually implemented, when you query an item in the database, it uh, also checks the uplog. It will convert this into DDP messaging and synchronize it with all of your clients in real time as well, which is pretty important. Um, the reason it's important for us is it reduces the code bloat of your application. So a lot of the code we write will be like trying to manage data change and trying to propagate those results throughout the entire application. And uh, Meteor have found a way to abstract all of that. So Mary Shaw said, like most of the code we write isn't actually um, targeting like what we want to achieve. It's making sure that we can get there, essentially.
I wouldn't say less than 10%, I don't know. Um, so how Mesa does that is reducing the amount of momentum reducing activities you have to do. So they eliminate tasks which aren't to do with what your client wants uh, fully. So things you always have to do, stuff like setting up the authentication and user layer, which is going to take development time. But it's going to be similar uh, for every application they set up automatically. Um, setting up the database, template, and networking systems for you, data propagation, which I just talked about. And then just general dev flow improvements, like hot code reloading whenever you save into your file. Um, Usually, like you'll have a watch process which does that for you, but you don't have to with Meteor. Um, then there's interaction triggered actions versus data triggered actions. So, what I mean by this is there's I think there's like two or three main ways you trigger um, stuff you have to do in your web applications. So there's UI based when like a user has to uh, like change data themselves. That would be interaction triggered. And then there's stuff like rendering data, which has to be done whenever the data changes. And there needs to be like a simple way of doing all that. And uh, the way Meteor allows you to do that is using reactive values. So bear with me. I'm going to quickly create a Meteor app. I know I don't have much time. <laughs> um, yes, it is that simple. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, this is like the level of volume I talk at. This, there's no changing this. OK, so we've got our template web application. So we can already see there's two different, um, there's two different ways of like uh, triggering, triggering actions. So there's this greeting function which is rerun whenever the data changes. Uh, right now, there is no actual data in there. So let's just say session get name. And then this is going to change whenever I set the name. And there's this function over here, which is interaction activated whenever the user clicks the input, for example. So we can see over here, it's currently undefined. And then as soon as. I was to set the actual session value, it's going to re-render. And we didn't have to write any other background code for that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to write any of the background code for that. Session set, yeah. Whoops. Thanks, guys. So we didn't have to write any of the background code for that. It just does it itself. And that's going to reduce the amount of code you write overall in your entire application. Um, so I thought this slide was like a really good way of explaining all this, but it turns out it isn't. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to. Should I? <laughs> OK. OK, so I think this is a slightly more general diagram which we can use. It's um, like, it's, uh, what's it called, cache synchronization. So this is a data triggered action. So whenever the data changes here, we need to um, make sure the caches are updated with the latest set of data. So I thought this would be a better diagram if I just like removed everything and then put data triggered action. This pretty much sums up um, uh, like what you need when you're using data triggered actions. Um, yeah, in summary, it greatly reduces the need for um, writing non app concern code. It's a good protocol for data sharing, which I didn't really touch on that much. And there's great community support. So, yeah. And here's what I hope for like sometime next year, more of us using Meteor every day and then also at work. Uh, that's all I had prepared. <laughs>